Hey, everybody. Uh, before I say anything else, I'm going to talk about the sun and the moon. Um, yesterday, they were very close together in the sky. And of course, you wouldn't have noticed the sun is so uh, bright. But uh, the, the moon passed just south of the sun. And then on the next orbit of the moon in early March, and again, they won't quite line up. But then the one after that, of course, April 8th, they're going to line up. And I hope all of you are going to uh, make plans and, and succeed in getting into the path of totality. It's the last total eclipse of the sun in the United States till 2044. And, um, you know, more likely to have sunny skies in Texas uh, rather than, you know, in the northern part of the country. But uh, my understanding is that the southern coasts of the Great Lakes, there are sort of little oases of higher probability of clear skies. So I hope all of you, hope the whole North American continent is completely clear for the entire eclipse and that we get to share this wonderful experience. All right, uh, to official business, welcome to the monthly lecture series of the National Capital Area Skeptics. I'm Scott Snell, the current president, live streaming from the Washington DC area. The National Capillary Skeptics is a nonprofit educational and scientific membership organization that promotes critical thinking and scientific understanding. We've been hosting these monthly events free and open to the public since our founding in 1987. Our specialty is publicizing information and perspectives that have been marginalized or outright ignored by most of the news media and publishers. Some of you hearing the word skeptics in our name may be thinking, oh no, close-minded people. But instead, skeptic means asking tough questions and following the evidence wherever it may lead us, whether it's where we expected or where we wanted it to or otherwise. We examine evidence-based claims. The scientific method with logic and reason are the tools we use to arrive at our sometimes tentative conclusions. There's an element of patience and frustration that each of us must manage internally through all of this process. After all, we want answers and sometimes we need answers right away. The self-discipline of skepticism may be its most difficult but valuable attribute to protect us from wrong answers. I've highlighted self-discipline. Our speaker today is going to discuss the uses and potential harms of psychedelics in medicine. The ability to dispassionately examine this topic may be a challenge for many or all of us. So let's meet our speaker. He's Peter Grinspoon, MD, instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School, a primary care physician and cannabis specialist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Grinspoon is a widely recognized expert on cannabis science and drug policy. He regularly appears as an expert on national television radio programs. He's quoted frequently in the national media. His articles have been widely published, and he's the author of his memoir, Free Refills, A Doctor Confronts His Addiction, and his most recent book, Seeing Through the Smoke, <laughs> A Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us from Boston, Massachusetts, Peter Grinspoon. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. My brother, David Grinspoon, who's an astrobiologist, also spoke uh, to you guys. I, I don't know how long ago, but uh, so it sort of runs in the family. Now, I'm very excited to talk about uh, psychedelics today. I, I also have a um, specialty in cannabis. Medical. I've been doing medical cannabis for 25 years. So if anybody has a question about cannabis at the end, I'm happy to to answer that as well. And I'm, I'm happy that you guys are skeptics because... Um, Psychedelics, it's so exciting what's happening, but the pendulum is swinging so quickly from the anti-psychedelic, of course it was pro before it was anti, anti, the war on drugs knocked it off course, but it's swinging so rapidly into the pro-psychedelics uh, pro that um, certain, some people are skeptical that some of the harms are being glossed over and some of the benefits are sort of being over-enthusiastically -enthousi touted. So. Uh, we can keep that in mind. I'm just going to share my screen, or I, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, share a screen. There it is. Share. Okay, here we go. So um, as mentioned, I'm P. 
Peter Grinspoon, thanks for the introduction. I have a recent book that came out, Seeing Through the Smoke, A Cannabis Expert Untangles the Truth About Marijuana. It really um, argues the cannabis case from both sides and talks about the harm, the real harms and the benefits, um, including lifestyle and wellness benefits as supported by science. Um, and, you know, the history of psychedelics. Psychedelics have a, a very, very long history. And again, you know, in just this one overview talk, I can't go into any aspect of it in, in super granular detail, but uh, psychedelics have been around for, for thousands of years. They've been used by indigenous cultures since time immor immemorial. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, there's a little bit of concern of like cultural appropriation and people going in and like digging up all the Ibogaine plants and like, you know, licking all the toads or, and, you know, making it so that the indigenous um, people who've been using this all along um, don't have access to it, which is, you know, we have to, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And also, um, you know, they sort of feel like their knowledge and wisdom from thousands of years should be uh, incorporated in what we do today with psychedelics, that it shouldn't just be like on the other end of the spectrum, big pharma developing types of molecules for depression without any indigenous wisdom. So then, as I mentioned, the, the war on drugs really, you know, there was research into psychedelics in this country in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then it started to tail off in the 70s as these drugs became demonized, you know, LSD caused insanity and DNA damage. None of that was true, but the war on drugs just like, you know, gave us this like corrupt, dirty, distorted lens to view everything about drugs. And, you know, a lot of these drugs have harms as well as benefits. I mean, both you know, and you need to have a nuanced and balanced discussion of them. But during the war on drugs, uh, specifically the U.S. government tried to create a moral panic about all these drugs. So in general, it's fair to generalize that the harms of these drugs have been vastly exaggerated um, and the benefits have just not been looked at until the last 10 to 15 years or so when um, research into these drugs um, started to gain speed again. And then we've been researching them like gangbusters in the last five to 10 years. And the research, which I'll go over briefly, has been just astoundingly uh, suggestive of like major, um, major ability to treat some of the cruelest conditions that humans face, like treatment resistant depression, you know, depression that has failed two or three conventional antidepressants. Uh, people become suicidal. And, and some of these drugs like ketamine are like, they look like wonder drugs. So we're going to try to balance this newfound enthusiasm, the very exciting research with a little bit of skepticism, just because, you know, this is happening so fast and there is some cause for concern, which we'll, which we'll discuss. Um, hold on, I'm just trying to advance my slides. So yeah, as I mentioned, the war on drugs was so harmful to all of this, to cannabis, to psychedelics, to to medicine in all aspects, because, for example, the U.S. government funded 80 to 90 percent of drug research worldwide. And so, you know, if we weren't investigating, like, what are the potential benefits of cannabis, not the harms, or are there benefits of psychedelics, uh, other countries couldn't do it either because we funded it. So... I can't even, I can't possibly overstate how much the funding for all of this has been harmed by the war on drugs. I'm just really glad that that this is slowly, slowly starting to change as people are realizing that with drugs, with all drugs, law enforcement aren't the right people to be involved. If someone has a problem with drugs, have them see a doctor or a nurse or an addiction specialist or a public health person or a social worker. If you arrest them or, you know, raid them or put them in prison, they just have another problem in addition to the drug problem they had originally. So not a big fan of, of the war on drugs. Um, <laughs> this is just a cartoon that some of you might remember, the fabulous furry freak brothers. And like, basically, you know, the propaganda, this is a satire on the anti-drug propaganda, but basically before drugs, people were like God fearing, you know, boy scouts and after drugs, they were like slovenly uh, troublemakers. So it's just kind of funny. Um, and then, you know, interestingly, I, I had a father who was a fairly legendary psychiatrist at, at Harvard Medical School, and he uh, tended to be way ahead of his time. He wrote a book advocating for legalizing cannabis in 1971, when only 12% of Americans supported legalization, and now about 70% do it. It went up about a point for each of the 50 years he worked on it. But anyways, in 1979, when I was 13, he published this book, Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered, which was calling from the rooftops 
to evaluate, research, and use psychedelics in psychiatry because he said there was a lot of really, really interesting research. And he was just so shut down for this book. Harvard didn't promote him to full professor despite, well, despite a lot of qualifications. So this is really interesting. He was like 40 years too early. And now um, at my hospital, Mass General, um, we have a center for the neuroscience of psychedelics at, at most major medical centers, Hopkins, UCLA, UCS, they have these psychedelic centers. So it's just really amazing that in, um, you know, 1979, my dad was like crucified for saying we should use psych psychedelics in psychiatry. And at that point, in fact, is as recently as like 15 years ago, 90% of psych psychiatrists were against psychedelics. They literally um, changed like lemmings or like sheep because now a mere 10 to 15 years later, uh, eight, 90% instead of being against are in favor of psychedelics. And it's really amazing how people can shift that quickly, their position from against to pro psychedelics when someone even 20 years earlier was saying we should be open-minded about this. So the history of psychedelics, both the drug himself, itself and the politics is endlessly fascinating. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about my personal connection. I read this book when I was 13 years old and I became a convert on the spot. Of course, 13 was when I started smoking pot too. So <laughs> I was sort of pro-drug at a very early age. Not that we recommend it for teenagers today. But um, as I mentioned, the pendulum is shifting. Uh, again, think of your brain on drugs, a little egg frying in the pan and all the nonsense we were taught. Again, LSD caused brain damage and insanity. And now just yesterday, I was reading the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, that's not exactly a bastion of hippie um, radicalism, the Wall Street Journal. And the story, uh, the woman's, the working woman's newest life hack, Magic Mushrooms. This article was an interesting article. It could have literally been an advertisement for the use of magic mushrooms. Every person they talked to had this drastically good response that helped them with focus, with energy, with mood, with creativity, with organization. Now, mushrooms can help with all of those things, but they don't always help with those kind of things. And there are certainly side effects and you have to know what you're doing and whether you're microdosing or macrodosing. But I just thought it was so amazing to be reading this in the Wall Street Journal when again, just, uh, 25 years ago, uh, my dad was trying to say the same thing and he was getting really criticized for it. So it is really, really interesting, the social history of all of these drugs. Now, um, the current scheduling of drugs under the Controlled Substance Act, which is about as ancient as uh, Nixon's war on drugs. It was the early 1970s and they came up with categories. Now, category one of the Controlled Substance Act is no medical utility and high abuse liability. Schedule two is like for dangerous and addictive drugs like oxycodone or Vicodin or well, Adderall, but Adderall should really be schedule three. Schedule three drugs, which they're talking about moving cannabis to from schedule one to schedule three is like Tylenol with codeine, uh, anabolic steroids, still drugs that are pretty dangerous. Um, and again, schedule one is no medical utility and high abuse liability. So it's absolutely insane that cannabis is in Schedule 1 with 4 million medical cannabis patients in this country who are doing well and probably 10 times that many who actually use cannabis medicinally. They just don't have cards. You know, you look at um, polls from dispensaries, uh, recreational dispensaries, and like two-thirds of people say they use it for sleep or for insomnia. But also in Schedule 1 is LSD, MDMA, and psilocybin. Um, now, we're going to talk about the medical utility and the abuse liability. And, um, you know, for example, psilocybin isn't addictive. Um, you can't get addicted to it. I'm not quite sure where they get high abuse liability. And as you'll see from the exciting new research, it, it certainly has tremendous medical potential. Now, ketamine is schedule three. That is less control. Again, schedule three is like Tylenol with codeine or anabolic steroids. It is um, the reason why we're seeing all these ketamine clinics pop up because it's not schedule one, schedule three. Ketamine is a very interesting drug that I could talk about for hours. It used to be a battlefield anesthetic. And then, um, you know, the same qualities that allow it to be a good anesthetic and painkiller are the same qualities that allowed it to become a drug of misuse. It causes euphoria, dissociation, relaxation. And that's why these ketamine clinics are popping up all over the place. You can go in and have an injection. It's really expensive. 
but people swear by it for treatment resistant depression or any kind of depression or alcoholism or OCD, or there are all these mail order places that send you ketamine. And, you know, <laughs> they don't seem particularly well regulated and there's not much oversight. You know, you just call them and say, I'm depressed. And they're like, sure, we'll send you ketamine. And, and ketamine is a very complicated drug. You have to be careful with it. I mean, very recently, Matt Perry overdosed and they thought it was largely due to ketamine. Of course, he was alone. He also had Suboxone in his blood and he was alone with an open body of water. So that's a disaster, whether it's ketamine or or just plain alcohol. But anyways, ketamine is really interesting and really, really uh, popular right now because of all the, the research that's coming out. Now, psilocybin and MDMA, which is ecstasy, uh, they are locked away in Schedule 1. However, they've been given special status by the United States government as breakthrough through therapy. Psilocybin, which is a magic mushrooms for treatment-resistant depression, and MDMA, ecstasy, um, for uh, PTSD, uh, the organization MAPS, run by Rick Doblin, is having tremendous success with the studies showing that MDMA is effective for um, for PTSD. People also want to use it for like couples therapy and for trauma, other types of trauma. So I think that psilocybin and MDMA will be legal in the next couple years. They'll still be pretty restricted, but they'll be legal. They certainly won't be in Schedule 1. And interestingly, of all places, Australia, about six months ago, legalized psilocybin and MDMA for psychiatric purposes. So they tend to be very conservative on cannabis. I don't know why they were the first ones to legalize these, but I, I suspect that they're going to be legalized like sooner rather than later. And then two states, Colorado and Oregon, have legalized or at least decriminalized psychedelics. And uh, many other states are, are following suit, potentially California, we're going to vote on it in Massachusetts in uh, November. Hopefully we'll decriminalize. There's no reason, again, to get law enforcement involved. If someone is having a bad trip, you want them to be over, able to call the police and say, I'm having a bad trip. Can you help me not be afraid of calling the police or afraid of calling anybody? So what are can the psychedelics treat? Different psychedelics can treat different things. Like, Kind of a whole debate, is cannabis a psychedelic? Anybody who's taken a high dose of an edible can certainly vouch that cannabis can be a psychedelic. And then we're talking about treating like colitis, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. Um, but if we're talking about the classic psychedelics here. Um, as I mentioned, treatment-resistant depression. Addiction is a huge, huge, um, is a huge category of interest for people uh, who are studying psychedelics. And a lot of you have heard of people who are addicted to heroin, go and take Ibogaine somewhere in Central America, then they come back, they're not addicted and they're doing really well. Um, you know, that's real. Uh, but, you know, we're just starting to show it now with studies. But it's kind of interesting. Patients have known it much longer than doctors have because we weren't allowed to study it. And the doctors were all kind of brainwashed by the war on drugs. But anyways, uh, and, and the addiction issue is very near and dear to my heart because um, I'm in recovery 15 years from opiate addiction, which is what my my memoir, Free Refills, is, is about. Um, we also use these things, or we're studying using these things for OCD, for chronic pain. Um, some people use psilocybin for these like cluster headaches, and they swear that it's like the only thing that works. Uh, psilocybin and other psychedelics are really, really interesting and being investigated for end of life care. They help people reconcile, come to terms, be at peace with what's going to happen with their life. They feel uh, very in touch with the world. They feel very mindful and they also can reconnect with their families. It's been really amazing. Some of the research among hospice and palliative care, uh, communities. And then, as I mentioned before, for couples therapy, people are very interested in well, they have these psilocybin couples retreats, and they also have MDMA uh, studies for couples therapy. So I think that's going to pan out to be really, really um, helpful. Now, how do we define or how do psychedelics work? Um, first of all, then we're going to talk about the different psychedelics. Now, this is for classic psychedelics. I, I should mention classic psychedelics are different from um, other psychedelics, like like. Psychedelics is a broad category where they put like maybe cannabis, MDMA, even though it works totally differently, it sort of works like an amphetamine, ketamine, which is a really weird mechanism of action, 
lumped together with these classic psychedelics, which are the classic psychedelics because they work on our serotonin receptors in our brains. They work on slightly different serotonin receptors than the SSRIs do, like your Prozac, your Zoloft, your Celexa. But it's really interesting. If you're on an SSRI, that blunts the effect of psychedelics. So um, for some therapeutic regimens, they take people off their SSRIs before they give them uh, psychedelics. But anyways, the classic psychedelics are psilocybin, as in magic mushrooms, LSD, and then the other ones like DMT, ayahuasca, ibogaine, mescaline, peyote. Um, mescaline and peyote are the same thing. Mescaline's the drug, peyote's the, the cactus, I guess. Ibogaine's the one that people go to South America to use or Africa um, that helps uh, with heroin or opiate addiction. Uh, ayahuasca and DMT are interesting. Uh, ayahuasca is like a herbal traditional brew. And it basically is DMT plus another medication called an MAO inhibitor, which prolongs the action. Because DMT, if you smoke DMT, it's very drastic, uh, the effects, but it only lasts for about 15 minutes. People who smoke D DMT um, report like the whole world disappearing and being um, replaced with uh, geometric, these spectacularly complex geometric uh, patterns. And then further on DMT, they, or on ayahuasca as well, they, they see these um, friendly, benevolent space aliens that communicate with us. And it's not a universal, but it's a very, very common experience on DMT. And people come back and have these drawings that are pretty similar of, again, these, these friendly space aliens. So it's really sort of mind-blowing. So again, the classic psychedelics, mushrooms, acid, and then the other category, which is ayahuasca, ibogaine, DMT. I mean, I had a friend who, it's expensive, I'm going to talk about cost later, um, who went to an ayahuasca ceremony in Costa Rica, and she was drinking like two bottles of wine a day, and she wanted to quit. And she had a great experience. The only problem is, well, not only did she quit alcohol, and there was no cravings, no withdrawal, she also quit smoking cigarettes, um, which wasn't even part of her goal. But then after about six months, the cigarettes and the alcohol came creeping back into her life. So I don't think it's like a permanent cure. Um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it, it certainly was astounding how well it worked for six months. Like we don't have that many other treatments that could do that. So how do the classic psychedelics work? It's a little bit hard to explain, but we have something called a d default mode network. It's part of our brain. It's sort of like the operating system of the computer. It's like how we function and organize our brain on a day-to-day -day basis, how we get things done. Now it's thought, and there are many theories about this, that you take uh, acid or some shrooms and there's less blood flow to the default mode network. So consequently, there's not less blood flow to the brain, just to that part of our brain. So consequently, all these other parts of our brain that don't frequently communicate that freely with each other can now communicate uh, very freely with each other. And that sort of explains the insight and the creativity. And also like people who are depressed ruminate. It's like they form these goat paths in their brain, the same thought over and over and over, I'm not a good person or blah, 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 nobody likes me. And when you have different parts of your brain communicating with each other, that can help really get rid of some of these ruminations. And then finally, for reasons that I would say are probably unknown, you become very amenable to therapy in the couple of weeks right after a psychedelic experience. And as I'm going to mention later, <clears throat> it's not just about taking the drug, though I actually think like taking the drug in the woods, taking mushrooms in the woods with your friends can be pretty therapeutic. Uh, it's really supposed to be therapy and the drug. It's psychedelic assisted therapy, not just consuming drugs. That's what the psychiatrists are in, psych interested in, psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, talked about the classic psychedelics, talked about the DMT space aliens, which I would love to meet one day. They're supposed to be friendly. And uh, then the other psychedelics, um, ketamine, Ketamine doesn't work on the serotonin receptors. It works on the NDMA receptors. Um, and it's very complicated to explain how it works. It's very hard to understand how ketamine works. Um, but suffice it to say, ketamine has been shown to be quite effective for treatment-resistant depression, even in patients who are suicidal. And it's not like you try, you're completely depressed. Other medications haven't worked. It's not like you're trying your third or your fourth SSRI and you have to wait, you know, two, three weeks to see if it helps you at all. Ketamine can lift people out of their depression within 40 minutes or so. It's really, really quick. 
um, and really astounding. Um, as I mentioned, you could just sign up to a clinic that's coming to your hometown soon and get injections. The problem is it's really expensive and they want to do like six injections over the first two weeks and each injection is like $600. So it's like 4,000 bucks just for the treatment, not covered by insurance. And then um, you have to do maintenance therapy. So again, one thing I'll talk about if we have time is like the last thing we need is these psychedelics to be another treatment just for the well-to-do. Uh, so we have to have insurance paying for them. There's also a ketamine nasal spray that they um, approved in 2019, uh, Bravado, and that works as well. I don't think it works as well as the injections. Um, you have to be monitored while you're taking it for a couple hours. Your doctors aren't allowed to just give it to you and like you just go off and do it. And then finally, there are the, these mail order ketamine clinics. And then there's MDMA, which all, all of you know about. And then there's, um, you know, also M MDA, sassafras. There's a whole bunch of drugs that are very similar to each other. Um, then there are designer psychedelics. Uh, my, This is a fascinating book, P. Call, um, a chemical love story by Alexander Shulgren. He was a Shulgin, he was a genius at developing psychedelic drugs and he developed so many of these. He was a friend of my father's and a friend of my brother's. And they're just so interesting. He describes the effects of these drugs. So if you're anybody's fascinated with drugs of misuse or, or not even drugs of misuse, drugs that can be potentially really helpful or could be misused, uh, I would highly recommend this book. And also I, I did have an experience a long time ago with 2CB and it was like mind blowingly interesting. So so again, it's not just about taking the drug. It's about taking the drug. And uh, what they do is they prepare you. Uh, you know, it's a little different if someone's done mushrooms or they haven't ever done mushrooms, but they explain what the um, trip is going to be like um, so that you're not caught by surprise. Uh, they they prepare you for it. They, they provide a very um, calming and relaxing set and setting. Because we'll, as we'll talk about set and setting or everything. You know, they have you in a comfortable chair with like quiet music and, you know, eye shades and they just have a really relaxing, soothing presence. You know, the last thing you'd want to do is like take a psychedelic like acid and then go to like a really stressful situation and then have someone call you and say, you're sick, kid's sick. You have to pick them up. Like you have to not have stressful things happen or this is going to turn out to be a disaster. So they prepare you, they monitor you during the trip. Um, now, who monitors you? It could be a therapist, it could be a psychiatrist, or it could be a shaman. And there's a big debate over who, what the qualifications are, number one, and two, who should be allowed to, to do this. And it's very expensive, especially if it's a psychiatrist or a therapist, because people are very vulnerable and suggestive when they're using psychedelics. And uh, there have been abuses, there have been sexual assaults, there have been financial abuses. So now I believe the standard of care is that you have two people monitoring you during the trip. And that's pretty expensive uh, if it's a therapist or a psychiatrist. And I'm sure there are some shamans, you know, whatever that is, um, who charge an arm and a leg for psychedelic therapy. But the point is there's preparation, there's monitoring. And then once you're done, as I mentioned before, you're very amenable to therapy for the next couple of weeks after this experience. Um, and they, you have further therapeutic sessions where they help you integrate the experience. And, you know, they often like try to find out what your goals are before embarking on this experience. And they, they help you integrate it and help you achieve these goals. And as I mentioned, there's some ethical issues, undue influence. I mean, psychedelics could be used to potentially to brainwash people. I mean, there was a lot of this research in that horrible um, US government program, which many of you have heard of MK ultra, where they just gave uh, huge doses of LSD to people trying to figure out how to brainwash soldiers. So undue influence, sexual abuse, financial abuse cost, you know, there are definitely a lot of things to think about during psychedelic, about psychedelic therapy. But again, it is psychedelic therapy. It's not just taking the drug. So what's the evidence base? There are thousands of studies. I'm just going to give you a couple just to show you the kind of research that they're doing and, you know, what the implications are. And this you could get from the title, psilocybin produces substantial and sustained decreases in depression and anxiety in patients with life-threatening cancer. A randomized double-blind trial. Now, the randomized double-blind trial are like the best type of evidence because theoretically, neither the doctor nor the patient knows the treatment you're getting. So they really can ferret out whether it's due to the placebo effect or whether it's due to the drug slash therapy itself. Now, I do have to say, Randomized controlled trials are the type of 
evidence that doctors respect the most. But with psychedelics, you have a very hard time randomizing and blinding uh, the different treatment arms. I mean, I personally, for one, would notice the difference if I were given a placebo or 100 micrograms of acid. In one case, nothing happens. And in the other case, the walls are melting and there are spectacular colors and so forth. So um, something like 90% of people guess which treatment arm they're in for these studies. So when they say a randomized double-blind trial, I, I, who am I to criticize? But it just doesn't seem like it's really randomized and blinded if people can guess whether or not they're on psychedelics. It, this is a problem not just with psychedelics, with cannabis, with other drugs that are psychoactive. Like if you try to do it with Valium, you know, one, one will do nothing if it's a placebo and the other will make you sleepy and relax. So um, anyways, th there is a ton of data. I'm just not quite sure that's randomized double blind trials. Rapid and sustained symptom reduction following psilocybin treatment for anxiety and depression in patients with life-threatening cancer. Again, imagine these people with life-threatening cancer. Imagine how anxious, how stressed out, how despondent, how hopeless they may feel, the insomnia, the chronic pain. And psilocybin helps with all of these. It's really, really amazing. And this was a single dose of psilocybin. People have this mystical experience and then they have insight and they're just much more reconciled, happier um, about all this. It's really improved. Um, so th this is really mind blowing. Again, I can't go over all the studies. I just wanted to give you guys a flavor. Uh, antidepressant effects of ketamine in depressed patients. We already talked about this, but um, found significant improvements in depressive symptoms in the 72 hours. As I mentioned, it can happen within an hour and it's really, really drastic. These not only does it help put people in remission from the depression, but it could help them maintain themselves in remission from depression. And the ketamine results have been really, really spectacular um, and amazing. Again, the jury's still out and ketamine does have side effects. You know, it can you can get addicted to it. It's called ketamine use disorder because it does cause euphoria by tickling the opiate receptors. So that's not the main way it works. Uh, you know, high blood pressure, it can cause dissociation. I mean, it's a weird drug I tried it. I felt really hopeful, but it also like it was a really weird drug. And, you know, when people dissociate, that's just a, you need to be supervised. You can't be dissociating by yourself. <laughs> you end up like walking in front of a bus. Um, MDMA and ecstasy, MDMA assisted therapy for moderate to severe PTSD, randomized placebo controlled trial. Again, <laughs> I would probably know the difference if I were given MDMA versus a placebo if I take one, I'd actually love everybody and everything. And if you took the other, nothing would happen. I took MDMA once in college and all my friends fell asleep and I ended up calling. I was so happy and it was like one in the morning and everybody's asleep. So I actually called my parents. They're like, what's wrong? Why are you calling at one in the morning? And I was like, mom, dad, I love you so much. I'm on MDMA. So as you can imagine, that ended well. Um, but anyways, uh, it is, there's increasing data. I mean, MDMA is probably going to be legalized and approved, again, under controlled circumstances, not not like at you know the corner store, um, before any other of these drugs that I'm talking about because of the profound data, mostly coming from Rick Doblin and his group's MAPS, which many of you may have heard of, uh, really demonstrating the benefit of PTSD in, uh, of MDMA and PTSD, too many four letter acronyms, uh, MDMA and PTSD. And like, imagine the potential this has for all of our combat veterans in this country um, and other people who are who have other victims of other ty types of trauma, like sexual assault or childhood abuse. It's really astounding um, to think of what, um, what benefit might accrue to all of this. Um, again, it's the strength of these, um, of these studies that is part of why 90% of psychiatrists went from being against psychedelic therapy to currently being in favor of psychedelic therapy. I, I have a whole chapter or a whole couple paragraphs in my book, Seeing Through the Smoke, about why the psychiatrists are so completely opposed to cannabis and so in favor of psychedelics. For, with cannabis, it's like, oh golly, that's illegal. We can't use cannabis. And with mushrooms or MDMA, they're like, hey, who cares if it's illegal? Let's do some acid and do some therapy. It's really this incredible double standard. I mean, it might be like white drug, bad drug. It might be the cannabis paved the way, or it might just be that there's more, more of this type of data that people like to see. But anyways, I digress. 
Development of a psychotherapeutic model for psilocybin assisted treatment of alcoholism. I, I wanted to include this one just because it's a psychotherapeutic model. It's psychedelic assisted therapy. It's not just the drugs. And it also pointed out that it was very helpful in getting people to um, approach uh, their problematic alcohol use. And that's a really, really big deal. We have some drugs, but we don't have great drugs uh, for alcohol. Oh, they're getting better for alcohol use disorder. We have um, injectable Vivitrol, which people can inject once a month. But if they could have a psilocybin assisted experience, have a mystical experience, have some really, really good integration, and then you know, motivational enhancement, a motivational interviewing, and then um, transcend their alcoholism. That is really, really amazing. And as I mentioned before, my friend who didn't even have that much therapy, she just took ayahuasca and she stopped drinking for six months. That's pretty astounding, especially as a primary care doctor who deals with so many people that can't stop drinking and you just see them like decay year after year after year. It's really, really awful. So what's the best venue to trip? Uh, of course, that picture, which um, the computer generated, looks like a pretty good venue to me. It's pretty beautiful. But is it in a hospital monitor setting? You know, should it be at MGH where my hospital is or Georgetown Hospital, whatever? The advantages of that is there's a lot of supervision. If someone freaks out, uh, you know, they can give them a sedative and they can watch over them. And another advantage is that it happens like in their native environment. It's not like you go and have this cool experience in Jamaica and then you get back to all of your triggers and your depression or your addiction comes back. Um, some people say that, feel that it's a lot better to be in the woods or in nature or on the beach in Costa Rica if you could afford it, because then you're not just there for a couple hours and then you're out in traffic and people honking and pollution. You're actually able to spend like three, four, five, six, seven days integrating, relaxing, maybe having two sessions, and then you really get it together before you go back home. So uh, this is not, um, and then with friends in the woods, again, I think could be really, really therapeutic. Of course, it's great if one of the friends is not taking mushrooms. So if someone freaks out, they could actually help them. Uh, but, you know, what is the best and most appropriate venue actually has import on whether and how we should decriminalize these drugs. As I mentioned, they're being voted on in Massachusetts and California is getting closer and it's already they're already legal in Oregon and uh, Colorado. Of course, this creates this really complex and dysfunctional um, disconnect between state and federal policy, just like we have with cannabis. But at the same time, legalization of some of these drugs is coming and decriminalization of more of them is coming. And, you know, what the best venue for them is. I mean, people who argue that it should be decriminalized and home grow should be allowed are the ones who argue that not everybody can afford $4,000 for a ketamine treatment. Not everybody can afford to do it in a fancy hospital. And like these things are therapeutic and people can act as informal guides and therapists. So I actually do believe they should be broadly decriminalized and you should be allowed to grow them at home and that we should treat any potential harms by educating law enforcement and having a lot of um, you know, social workers and healthcare workers to help people and um, really educating people. And that way people would have a safe supply uh, if they did get into help, they wouldn't be worried about getting in trouble. They could just ask for help. So I'm in favor of decriminalizing all this stuff. But you can make good arguments um, for all of these different venues and whether it should be more restricted, like only with a prescription in the hospital or whether anybody who wants to can have access to them. I actually think something, it shouldn't be like a cannabis dispensary, like a free-for-all. You don't want to get upsold on acid and then take way too big a dose and freak out. But maybe it's something like, state controlled stores so that people can have access to them and know they have a safe supply, but maybe some education is involved um, as you're purchasing them, something like that. So how do you set yourself up for success um, if you're going to use psychedelics? Uh, set and setting is the most important thing, right? You want to be out in the woods, preferably without your phone. They'll have your trip set or have a phone for emergencies. Be there with a trip sitter, someone who's not using any drugs, so they can help you if there's any problem. And you have to get the proper dosage. People boast about taking heroic doses of mushrooms, but that can be really, really scary, especially if you're just starting out. Try, try a small dose, and then the next time, try a slightly bigger dose. You know, start low and go slow. Why, why the first time have a huge dose? Keep in mind that like ayahuasca, um, ibogaine, 
LSD acid, those are really, really, really long and intense trips. And the DMT can be really weird. And mushrooms, even if you take too much, can be scary. So really like do the proper dosage, make sure you have a trip sitter, you don't have to drive. The set and setting is nice and relaxing. Nothing bad's going to happen. You're out somewhere beautiful or you're in a room with friends and no, no, someone's in charge of the kids. So you're not going to be, uh, have to be thrust into a position of responsibility when you're in a highly altered state and then make sure you have a safe supply. And that's what I think legaliz legalizing or decriminalizing will help do is help us all get a safe supply. Uh, right now, if you want to use these things, you're stuck sort of in the gray market trying to get a good supply, but it's not really regulated. So I think I think legal drugs are safer drugs across the board. But I won't get spend too much time on my soapbox here. Um, this is an interesting discussion. Do you even need uh, the mystical experience? Um, you know, they these drugs work by tickling the serotonin receptors. And as I mentioned, there's clearly some overlap with your SSRIs. Um, even though you don't usually have a mystical experience and hallucinate with your uh, Prozac. Uh, because if you're on an SSRI, it really blunts uh, the effect of a lot of these psychedelics. So do you need the mystical experience? In my experience, yes. The mystical experience is really profound. It's really deep. It helps you connect with nature. It helps you see the world in a much more beautiful and peaceful way. It absolutely helps you mindfully connect to your surroundings and those around you. But, uh, Drug companies are frantically trying to research psychedelics or quasi-psychedelics that don't give you the trip, but that can also alleviate depression very, very rapidly or help with alcoholism. Um, it's an open book. It's an open question whether they're going to succeed in being able to do that. A lot of psychedelic purists like myself, again, believe you do need the mystical experience, but um, we'll see. You know, you can't predict, as I learned when I was a philosophy student, uh, you can't predict uh, what we're going to develop or discover. So they're trying to discover it. So it'd be really interesting if they have like quasi pro quasi psilocybin that doesn't cause you to hallucinate, but does help with the depression. So that's to be determined and potential harms. 10% of people have a bad trip. Um, interestingly, uh, that means 90% of people have a good trip, but a bad trip can be very, very scary. Um, and um, interestingly, of the people that have bad trip, something like two thirds of them said it still was an important experience that helped them grow, learn and change, even though they didn't really enjoy it. But a bad trip can be very, very scary. It can cause anxiety. It can cause panic. Um, it can even cause like a brief psychotic episode. Uh, I mean, psychedelics in general can 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 trigger psychosis and a lot of drugs can cannabis, steroids. Um, amphetamines like Adderall and and certainly psychedelics. Um, you know, we recently heard of um, this national story where this airplane pilot did mushrooms and two days later he was still psychotic, still delusional, and he tried to crash the airplane. So you could have a bad trip and it could also cause a substance-induced psychotic disorder, uh, which could be, which is complicated, but it could be a brief psychotic disorder or it could help trigger or it could help destabilize someone who has schizophrenia or bipolar or who's destined to develop schizophrenia or bipolar, but hasn't manifested it yet. So bad trip psychosis, as I mentioned before, undue influence. There was this horrible story of this woman who was this psychedelic guide for this elderly Holocaust survivor, and she embezzled millions of dollars from him. It was horrible using the undue influence you could have over someone when you're their psychedelic guide. She got caught and got in trouble, but it was really awful. And then finally, persisting perceptual disorder. Sometimes, rarely, the perceptual um, the perceptual changes in your vision, in your perception of color, um, which are so cool when you're tripping, could actually last and be very, very bothersome for months and even years. So persisting perception disorder is real. Now, they also, the psychiatrists say there's a hallucinogen use disorder, like you get addicted to them, but it, it's very hard to see anybody getting addicted to ibogaine, ayahuasca, mushrooms. It, it's They don't cause that much euphoria and they're such weird, intense experiences. And they only work if you do them every couple of weeks because your brain gets really used to them. You can't do mushrooms every day unless you're microdosing, which is a whole another conversation. So 
Um, I just don't really, I didn't list it, believe that hallucinogen use disorders is really a thing to worry about. As I mentioned, how do you access psychedelic therapy? You're in the audience, you're listening, you're like, great, I have treatment resistant depression, I'm going to get psychedelic therapy. It's very difficult until they legalize it. When they legalize it, it would be a lot easier, but we're going to need urgently, like Rick Doblin, the head of MAP said, we're going to urgently need 20 to 30,000 psychedelic therapists the minute they legalize it. So we're going to be very short in therapists. We're very short in therapists anyways, if anybody's tried to get a therapy appointment. But you could sign up right now for a research study at an academic institution, though I have to say a lot of them have waiting lists. You could try your luck on the gray market, you know, if you know a good source. It's a lot easier to get mushrooms than it used to be. A lot of people are growing them and from a friend of a friend of a friend. So if you're sort of in druggy culture, it's pretty easy to get mushrooms. But if you're... Um, just a person starting out and you're not in that culture at all, it can be very difficult. And I think there are a lot of fake sites online that say, sure, send me $200. I'll send you some mushrooms. And then you send them the $200 and you never hear from them again. So you have to be very, very careful on the gray market to make sure not only that you don't get ripped off, but that the what you actually get is safe because you don't want to think you're taking ecstasy and actually be taking PCP or fentanyl. I mean, it can be very dangerous. That's why Drug testing is really important as well. But you can also go overseas. Like um, in Jamaica, at a lot of the resorts, they just have mushrooms and they have mushroom yoga, mushroom breakfast, mushroom hike, mushroom tea, um, mushroom bonding session. I mean, so there are a lot of places overseas which you can go, which I still think overseas, it's a gray market. But in, in a lot of places, it seems very safe. You know, very safe apart from the dangers of the drug, uh, which we already talked about. Um, cultural respect, I just wanted to mention briefly, people have been using these medications for thousands of years and, you know, now they're a psychedelic tourists and they just come in and they just sort of are perceived as trampling all over these indigenous cultures and practices that have gone on for thousands of years. You know, for example, and also in the rainforest, we're like clear cutting the rainforest and, you know, people just want respect and they want to be heard. And I think a lot of indigenous people who have been practicing these things since time immemorial are sort of feeling like this whole thing's happening and they've been doing all along and they deserve a share, a stake and a voice. And I think that um, a lot of uh, feathers are being ruffled and, um, you know, we certainly need to pay attention uh, to doing this in a way that doesn't disrespect or culturally appropriate in ways that are harmful or unethical. Um, microdosing. I wrote a whole blog about this, microdosing for Harvard Health. Does it work? Um, if you want to summarize my blog in two words, it's definitely maybe. Now, microdosing is using like a tenth or so of a perceptual dose. So instead of 100 micrograms of acid, you take 10 micrograms. Of course, you want to be very careful because you can't really see, touch, or taste acid. You don't want to actually take, accidentally take 100 micrograms and be tripping for eight hours. Or instead of taking like two grams of mushroom, you take 200 milligrams. So it's not perceptual, but everybody who does this says that it improves their mood, their focus, and their creativity. Silicon Valley, very popular. Among high achieving people, very popular. In that Wall Street Journal article um, that I showed at the very beginning, you know, all these executives and CEOs are using it to help them with focus, with creativity, with organization. Yet when they do randomized controlled trials, where they blind people to whether they're getting a psychedelic in a microdose or a placebo. And you actually can do these blinded studies for microdosing because you don't trip, you don't feel it. It's sub-perceptual. They haven't shown in these um, good studies that it has an effect. So we have this like gap, this chasm between virtually everybody who does microdosing says that it helps them. And, we, and it hasn't been studied that much, but the few studies we have really don't show definitively that it that it does help. Um, you know, I just think it's very interesting. And I think that ultimately it is going to turn out to help. They just don't turn out to be helpful. They just don't know the dose yet. And you might need a slightly higher dose. I mean, on the one hand, if you, anybody who takes a pill, if you tell someone this pill is going to make you feel more creative and happy, they usually will feel more creative and happy. The placebo effect is really, really strong. You can't say it's just the placebo effect. The placebo effect is huge. Um, but at the same time, uh, these people are so definitive about how helpful it is. 
I tried it and I, I couldn't say definitively whether it was helpful or not. So I'm still on the fence about whether microdosing is, um, is effective. I'm a huge advocate of macrodosing and of decriminalizing if it's done safely, but microdosing, we'll see. Uh, if you're interested, in, you just look up the Harvard Health blog under my name and it has all the information, all the studies about microdosing. If you're interested in seeing uh, what the, the data is for and against. And I just mentioned it because all of you know people who are microdosing. I mean, it, it, everybody's microdosing these days. It's really, really amazing how popular it is. Cost. Uh, I don't have to go into a lot. I talked about how expensive the ketamine infusions were. Um, getting psychedelic assisted therapy is like hours with the therapists. Then you have to get the drug and pay for the room and so forth, unless you do it at home. Then it's hours more of the therapists. Um, it can cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Health insurance doesn't pay for it. And like, you know, I work as a primary care doctor in an inner city clinic with these impoverished patients. Like none of them could spend $15,000 to go to Jamaica or Costa Rica for a relaxing psychedelic retreat. I mean, it's got to be not just another treatment for the rich. It's got to be the Elon Musk of the world, you know. I made a joke on Twitter. <laughs> he, he was doing so many drugs and there were uh, psychedelic drugs and um, there are articles about it. I'm like, maybe this will fix his personality. Um, so hopefully that will transpire. But again, it can't just be for people like that. It's got to be for everybody. It's just not fair to have these wondrous treatments that most people can only read about or hear about on TV and and not even access. Um, and is cannabis a psychedelic? I could talk about this for hours. Uh, cannabis Psychedelic just means change in consciousness and cannabis definitely can be a psychedelic and it works on different receptors, not the serotonin receptors, the cannabinoid receptors. We have natural cannabinoid receptors in our brains, but it also helps people with insight, with personal growth, with connection to other people, with connection to nature. It helps people with a lot of the same things that classical psychedelics do just in a different mechanism. And I think more and more, there's going to be less of less and less of a dichotomy between psychedelics and cannabis. I think that it's sort of more of a continuum of care. Um, just to be self-promotional for one second, uh, this is my book, Seeing Through the Smoke. It came out on 420. It really um, talks a lot about the social history of cannabis, the 20 million arrests for nonviolent possession because of the war on drugs, mostly in people with black and brown skin, which has been a disaster, why we need to legalize it, all the harms, real and imagined, um, which were just fever dreams of the drug war and which are actual harms to be worried about. Like, I don't recommend cannabis for teenagers, pregnant or breastfeeding women, or people with a history or family history of psychosis, or if you have an active cardiac condition, if you're not in one of those can categories, it's actually a pretty safe uh, medication. I talk about all the things it can help people with, the things it can and can't help people with. It can help you with the symptoms of cancer, like the nausea, the weight loss, the pain, the anxiety, the insomnia, but it doesn't cure cancer like some cannabis advocates claim. Uh, so if you get cancer, for example, um, you want to get an oncologist and use cannabis for the symptom relief. And then I have a final chapter uh, talking about lifestyle benefits, the way it helps people um, enhance their experience with like music, art, sex, literature, uh, interpersonal connection. Um, and then uh, people could reach me and especially if they think of a question later in the day, um, at my website, which is www.petergrinspoon.com. It's grin like smile, spoon like fork. And with um, at this website, there's a contact me button. And if you have any questions for me, please feel free um, to contact me. It also has my Harvard Health uh, blogs on a whole bunch of issues about psychedelics and cannabis and microdosing and ketamine and about the drug war. And it has um, my books and a lot of other stuff. So I think that's the last slide. Um, so at that point, we're almost at the half hour, which is where we started. And I was asked to speak for about an hour, a little bit less. So I'm going to turn it over. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we do have some questions. Also, I if I saw your book um, info correctly, you noted that it was released on April 20th. <laughs> Probably not a coincidence. Is that right? No, they wanted to release it on April 15th on 415. And I was like, guys, you can't release a book on cannabis on 415. Can we hold it for four days so we have a beautiful 420 release? And they were like, let's check with our marketers. And every single marketer in the whole publishing company 100% agreed with me. So we had a very festive 
420 with a huge book party and it was just a lot of fun. I see. Um, by the way, uh, is, is there an official disclaimer for this presentation in terms of, obviously you're talking about various treatments and so forth, but you know, obviously you, you want to consult with your primary care physician and, and so on. Is that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, the thing is, uh, you know, you, right. Psychedelics, well, the primary care physician might not know much about it. You want to consult with a medical professional that knows something about it before doing this. And and nothing in my um in my presentation is meant to be medical advice or encouragement to use any of these drugs. I just want to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, yes. and to give people a general background because everybody's talking about these drugs. And I want to just kind of contextualize it for people. But certainly, if you're going to do it, you need to educate yourself about it and ideally talk to a psychiatrist or a physician who knows about it and can wisely guide you how to safely use it. Mm -hmm. um, question from Dorothy Trin here in Maryland. Uh, you had used the term integration uh, on an earlier slide. And uh, would you define that, please? Well, I it pretty much is just what it sounds like. You know, you have this really intense mystical experience on mushrooms or acid or ayahuasca or DMT and uh, or ibogaine. And, you know, how do you, what are your goals? Say your goal is to stop drinking or to develop a healthier relationship with alcohol. You know, the preparation session would be like, you know, what are your goals? What have you tried in the past? Then this is what it's going to feel like. This is what it's going to be like. Then you have the, like this really, really intense, people describe it as an out of body experience, a mystical experience, an experience where like, they like all the superficiality of the personality melts away and they get the really, really deep core. And then they're just a little bit like, how do I put this all together? And the integration is like, you put together all the insights you had during your experience linked with what your goals are. New goals, of course, could emerge. Um, and how do you pull it all together? How do you tie it all together? So you go back into your life with what you've learned, with all the growth and change that you've been able to achieve? How do you harmoniously and coherently go back into the same life you had before the whole endeavor? So that's pretty much what integration is. Mm -hmm. She also wonders if microdosing produces any uh, visible effects in brain imaging. It does produce visible effects in brain imaging. It doesn't produce visual effects in human beings, like you don't hallucinate, right. but you could definitely see, uh, it would be, I'd have to look into like what, you know, what gets lit up and more and what gets, gets lit up less. But it's certainly, it's certainly just like macrodosing allows parts of the brain to communicate with each other that don't orally, ordinarily communicate with each other, but not nearly to the extent that macrodosing does. And the question is whether it's, enough to really make a difference in the things that it's purported to help with creativity and mood. Mm -hmm. What about these drugs in, in, in terms of uh, attention deficit disorder? Um, that she asked uh, this question. Um, well, um, that hasn't been studied. Treatment that will, or, or oh, possibly causing it. Well, that hasn't really been studied. It will be studied. They're studying it for everything. Now, I don't think, I don't know if a macro dose would help with attention deficit disorder, um, unless, you know, it helped you address some like fundamental anxiety that was like sort of helping to drive attention deficit disorder, which is worse with anxiety and depression. But a microdosing, people really, really say, it's really interesting to read what people say about microdosing. And they talk a lot about how it helps them with, with focus. And, you know, again, to diverge a little bit on cannabis um, as a psychedelic, like, I know people that take like one puff of cannabis and they don't really get high, but they just get really focused people with ADHD. And then they're like, they can get their work done. I know so many people that like secretly do it before work because it helps them concentrate and focus. So I think cannabis can absolutely definitely help with ADHD and other people it can make it a lot worse. And it depends on the dose and the strain, but cannabis, absolutely. And, and again, with psychedelics, the classic psychedelics, people swear that it helps with this, but there isn't good. I can't point you to a study that says, yes, this is a randomized controlled trial that shows that microdosing or macrodosing helps with ADHD. So I would put that in the to be determined category, unless you're talking about cannabis. Okay. One of our participants, I'm not a hundred percent sure of this, possibly joining us from Toronto, um, wonders if there are any effective treatments for something called derealization. I'm on um, familiar oh. with this, caused by complex post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Um, right. Stress can cause depersonalization and derealization. It's like a break with reality. Ah. It can even cause like amnesia. You forget who you are. I had a patient who had amnesia. She ended up in another city. She didn't even remember who she was until she got some help. Um, and derealization is really, really scary. It, um, there aren't great treatments for it. It's not that well understood and it's incredibly traumatic. You're like dissociated and you're sort of separated from yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought she was going to ask, is that, can that be a symptom of psychedelic use? And actually it can, you can have derealization and depersonalization as a rare, rare side effect from the psychedelics themselves. Um, I didn't add in the slide I had of harms, every single potential harm, but that is one. I'm really glad, uh, our listener brought that up. Now, in terms of treatments, I don't treat this. And I think it's a very sub sub specialty uh, within psychiatry. And I just don't think there are good treatments for derealization. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't use a psychedelic <laughs> until there's more data could make it worse. I'm changing gears over to one of your earlier slides where you talked about, you know, different cultures, uh, some of them ancient using these substances. Um, one of our um, participants, uh, Beth, in uh, Washington, D.C., has uh, raised the question of how interesting that, uh, you know, the old world, Europe, wasn't into that uh, sort of um, exploration, I guess you'd say, uh, until contact, you know, the Colombian uh, and, and afterwards. And um, is, is that simply because these plants uh, weren't or, or fungus weren't available in, in uh, old Europe, um, and it was just, you know, in the new world? Well, all substance, all societies, all cultures have used psychoactive substances. You know, uh, this country during the war on drugs, we're allowed to drink and to use tobacco and caffeine. So mm -hmm. there's no society throughout history that hasn't used psychoactive substances. Mm -hmm. Why certain societies used certain substances and others use others. It probably had to do with their religion, their culture, and as the uh, listener mentions, the availability. Um, and, it, you know, in Europe, um, I think in ancient Europe, there was some psychedelic use, but in, right, Enlightenment era Europe, um, I don't think there was a, well, first of all, LSD wasn't invented to the 1940s, but talking about mushrooms and ayahuasca, and I began, first of all, some of these plants are, like, I began as indigenous to um, tropical climate. So it wouldn't, they wouldn't have Ibogaine and LSD hadn't been invented yet, but other ones like mushrooms, I don't know. Um, I think they probably just hadn't been introduced yet, but they, there were plenty of other mind altering substances that Europeans were using, just not these substances. But mm -hmm. the answer to that is it has to do with what they've been exposed to, what grows there, what trade there is in substances, their culture, their religion, and other uh, previous experiences with the drug. And, you know, I, that's the best answer I could have about why they did or didn't use these substances in Europe. But I, I think they were used other substances and these were indigenous plants to other parts of the world. And that's how people figured out to start using them. I mean, you always wonder how people figure it out the first time. Like, right. I guess people are starving and they eat a mushroom and they hallucinate and they're like, wow, this was cool. Let's all eat these mushrooms. Uh -huh. uh, at, probably have, have, have after having other people eaten other mushrooms and probably died. So I guess it's a lot of trial and error, but yes. interesting question. I'd have to learn more about the social history. Yeah, I wonder if um, uh, Jared Diamond, you know, guns, germs, and steels uh, ever touched on that aspect, or at least the question Hey, Europe, you know, obviously the Enlightenment and all these technical advances, um, was it because they were not in a drug um, distorted, I sound pejorative, but, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I am going to be asking you questions that sound like um, value judgments. And I do want to be clear, it's, it's in the spirit of skeptical inquiry, as I mentioned in the opening. Um, you know, sort of poke at the edges of your uh, claims and um, your recommendations. Um, but anyway, um, you know, Jared Diamond, I, instead of guns, germs, and steel, should write weed, acid, and shrooms. <laughs> That'd be a great well, uh, will that be your next book? <laughs> that should be. <laughs> it sounds like you're going to look up the question of, you know, what was the indigenous uh, plant and fungi of uh, Europe and uh, to see if there might be something interesting about that um, Absolutely. in terms of human um, 
development, to civilization for that matter. Um, I mean, a lot of the religious visions throughout history have been occasioned by psychoactive substances. So there must have been something they were tripping on. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask you, um, in one of your earlier slides, you seem to be skeptical about some of these, um, you know, uh, randomized clinical trials. Uh, the, you know, the um, it's you, you wondered, hey, how could they have really double-blinded uh, things that have euphoric uh, effects uh, with placebos? And um, does that suggest that this might be part of the, uh, you know, replication crisis that uh, so many scientific papers um, end up not really being um, scientific, you know? What are well, your thoughts on that? I explain why it's hard to blind psychedelics because they're so psychoactive. They're profoundly psychoactive. So obviously most people would be able to guess that over placebo. The studies still showed benefit. They just weren't as high a quality of study because they weren't blinded. Uh -huh. um, you know, now they're talking about using other substances like Valium so that you do have a psychoactive effect. But honestly, I could tell whether I had Valium versus acid. They're like, they couldn't be more different. That's not going to work at all. Uh -huh. But the study still showed benefit. The problem is, as I mentioned, the placebo effect is really, really strong. Doctors these days aren't allowed to use the placebo effect because, which is sort of unfortunate because it's not considered, you know, the patient rights movement. It's not considered a patient can make an informed decision and give informed consent if they're being misled about the nature of, um, of the treatment they're being given. But I remember when I was a little kid, this woman freaked out in an airplane and like was having a panic attack. And, you know, the pilots were like, do we have to go back? Do we have to land the plane? Is there a doctor there? And my dad raised his hand. He was a psychiatrist and uh, he had his medicine bag. He always carried it around mm -hmm. um, and they asked him to sit next to her and he sat next to her and gave her a pill and said, this pill is going to calm you down. And within 15 minutes, you're going to be happily relaxed. You might even fall asleep. And within 15, 20 minutes, happily relaxed, she even started snoozing and the pilots were grateful. They could land where they were planning to land. The flight wasn't delayed. And all my dad gave her was a sugar pill, again, which we're not allowed to do these days, but you were allowed to do back then. That was a very important thing that he carried with him in his medicine bag. This was probably like 40 years ago. So the placebo effect is huge. And the advantage of these randomized double blind placebo controlled trials is that they ferret out the placebo effect. However, yeah. If you have a hugely positive result, for example, from a lot of these psychedelic studies like MDMA and PTSD, if like 90% of people are getting better, it doesn't matter as much if it is because the placebo effect wouldn't cause that much of a change. Okay. Um, yeah, forgive me. I've um, lost the... Uh... Thread I wanted to. Oh yeah, sorry. Our uh, Canadian participant uh, pointed out that there's something called am amanita or amanita muscaria in Europe. Um, so if you want to Google that later, um, that's this is one of the uh, um, psychoactive or I, I hope I'm not mutilating your terminology uh, mushrooms um, that were uh, present in in old Europe and. Uh, so. Right. And like even in, you know, the Salem witch trials, people were having hallucinations because of the mold um, in the wheat. I mean, a, a lot of that was explained by like psychoactivity, like accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there are a lot of these substances and, you know, there's a lot of history about that. I just don't happen to have it all on the top of my head. I see. Um, you had shown in your slides some fairly recent uh, papers, um, you know, 2023, for example, I just glanced, you know, as you're going through. Um, what about somewhat older studies? For instance, there was an MDMA study in Nature uh, from a few years ago, uh, 2021, uh, you know, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study of that. Have those held up? Um, yes, they uh, have held up. Okay, uh, that's why MDMA is on track to be legalized because they've held up. Keep in keep in mind this is a little bit technical, but they're like phase one studies, phase two studies, and then phase three studies. Phase one studies are just like, is it feasible to do this kind of study? Phase with just a sh small number of participants. Phase two is, is it safe? It's not even looking for effect, but is it safe? 
often they see an effect, but is it safe? And then phase three and, and further are much larger studies, um, which try to give you a really powerful effect. Uh, you know, the more numbers you have, the more statistical significance you can generate. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the studies have absolutely held up. And again, that's why ketamine is available and why psilocybin and MDMA had this emergency authorization uh, to be used, which is why you can use them in academic medical centers and why they're on track to be legalized. So mm -hmm. I would say the studies have completely held up. The only problem with the studies is that... Um, they weren't blinded, as I mentioned before. Yes. And, then, um, you know, and, and also, you know, studies of cannabis, they say like 8% of people have a bad a side effect. It tends to be like dry mouth or a little dizziness. Like in these studies, if you have a bad trip, it could actually be a really serious uh, side effect. And in one or two of the psilocybin studies, there was actually um, some suicidality reported as a side effect. Now, of course, these are already very depressed people with uh, treatment resistant depression, but at the same right. time, there were some concerning side effects. So I would say the benefits have held up, but there also are some potentially scary side effects. And we had trouble, as I mentioned before, with blinding. Mm -hmm. You described for psychedelic therapy, you know, the inequities involved, it's expensive. There's a shortage of, uh, I, I guess you called them trip sitters or personal guides to help people who are, you know, engaged in this therapy. Um, is it possible that an online human personal guide could suffice uh, to keep costs down or maybe someone from even a different uh, state in the United States or province in Canada is helping someone or is that too risky? Well, that's a good question. I'm sure that someone's going to try that. You know, I mean, I'm always a big believer in like in personal human contact if someone needs a hug or you know, they need to sit down. You you can really tell a lot more about how a person's doing in person. During the pandemic, you know, we'd go in, primary care doctor, risk our lives. It was miserable. And after a while, it got too dangerous and they started having us see patients virtually. Mm -hmm. You really couldn't tell nearly as well how someone was doing virtually. Like I had one patient that was like slurring their words and I couldn't tell she was drunk at 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And if I were with her in person, I could have told in two seconds. So a lot would be lost if you did it virtually. I see. In the case of extreme shortage, and if it's a question of virtual or nothing, I bet they will be able to come up with protocols um, that can help people. But, uh, you know, huge, huge advocate for in-person. Again, it's set and setting and set and setting is going to be with either very trained clinicians or people that you love you know, and, and like. Uh, it's not going to be a computer screen with some distant person. It, it just doesn't seem like it's as, you know, suited for this. Right. In a but way, it's already, better than nothing, certainly. Right. In a way, you've already answered my follow up question, which was, and I bring this up uh, in, in context uh, in, in different skeptical topics, and that is the potential for artificial intelligence to help people. You know, the smart friend that all of us want, sometimes don't have. Um, to say, hey, uh, here's how to assess this news item that you've just seen, or in this case, to be your trip sit or your personal guide, but it, it can't hold your hand, maybe a robot. <laughs> um, well, you know what? Actually, that's maybe I have answered my own question that an AI robot could hold your hand. Some yeah, that sounds help. really warm and warm and cuddly there. Um, well, no, no, that's just it. Well, it, when, when you're under the influence, you feel something like warm flesh holding your hand. And if you were stone cold sober, you would say, hey, this is a, a machine. But in this other state, uh, my God, you might see it as a as a god or something. I, yeah, I, I think it might be a little scary. But, you know, it's interesting with AI, you know, they don't know right now who's going to have a bad trip and who's not. Right. You know, is it family history of psychosis? Is it people with childhood trauma. I think AI could really help us like looking at the medical records of a hundred thousand people who have tripped and trying to understand why the 800 of them had bad trips. Is there some common feature? Okay. So I think AI could really help us when just thinking about this for the first time with like patient selection. Okay. Um, but I don't think I'm not a huge fan of like, you know, the friendly robot holding your hand instead of a person. Again, if it's a question of something versus nothing, it might be really helpful. Mm -hmm. But um, again, there's no there's no substitute for for human connection. Right. Um, 
your, your comment just now did open the door for something I did want to explore briefly, and that was, um, um, you know, the fact that we don't fully understand the human brain, and it's a black box still in many ways, where it's like, oh, what's it going to do if we do this, <laughs> whether it's an electroshock uh, therapy or uh, a chemical that's being introduced um, I mean, other than, you know, metabolizing foods in our environment, although some of those, obviously mushroom that's been misidentified and um, I didn't order a pizza with that kind of mushroom intentionally or something, but um, I did want to explore it from that angle. And if you'll bear with me for just a minute, um, you know, obviously humanity evolved in a particular environment, uh, apparently Southern and Eastern Africa. And we adapted very well uh, out of necessity. We were in that environment for, I think, hundreds or thousands of human generations and eating foods and, you know, using our bodies in a particular way and so on. So it seems to me if we imitate the success of our ancestors who were very well adapted to that environment, that we would thrive as well. They were very successful, uh, took the whole planet eventually, Homo sapiens. And, um, you know, like a few hundred thousand years ago for, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of human generations in this environment. And we're not imitating them, right? We're rather sedentary. We're introducing non-food, you know, non-nourishment uh, substances and I, you know, I, obviously, I'm, I don't want to be in a judgmental frame, although it sounds like it, and I don't think I can avoid it. And I hope you'll bear with me on that question. Should we be extremely cautious at introducing these non-nourishment substances and instead emphasize non-sedentary behavior, vigorous exercise? Isn't that, excuse me, isn't that the number one therapeutic step if possible to oh, sure, sure sleep exercise and nutrition right. will go a long way to healing chronic pain to healing insomnia to healing anxiety but depression depression but when you say these are non-nourishing foods they're very nourishing they're just nourishing for our psyche <laughs> so well, that's just it i might respectfully disagree to say let's imitate our ancestors in this very um adaptive environment they were in, they were not eating these psychoactive mushrooms, probably. They weren't ingesting caffeine. They weren't ingesting, um, obviously, LSD, 1940s, and so on. It's like, let's imitate them. Let's eat. I, I'm not suggesting the paleo diet necessarily, but it seems to me step one is do no harm as a physician. It's like, let's not do these sort of uncertain frankly, experiments, uh, usually self-administered by amateurs in our culture, um, and, and, and instead really hammer hard, I hate that metaphor, but really emphasize, look, let's be healthy. Um, brains are to be cherished. This is a wonderful, mysterious organ, and let's not do little perturbations or um, as I said, experiments. Well, according to that, and that sort of romanticizes the past and sort of minimizes all the medical progress we've made. I mean, if by, by that argument, we wouldn't use Prozac or any uh, drug that just came out on the market. You've and, just said, I agree with what you just said. Yeah. And, you know, it's an individual choice. You know, people have always experimented with their consciousness and I feel that I feel that people should be allowed to experiment with their consciousness this is a fundamental human right as long as they're not hurting anybody or driving impaired. I, yeah, I feel the same way. The phrase I've seen you use, I've, I've watched some of your videos ahead of today. You have a great line, just say wait. Right. Yeah. We don't want teenagers using cannabis because it's exactly. like their brain development. That's so right. as long as you're doing it with education and with sensible regulations, I just yes. don't think criminalization is the way to go because that make first of all, why criminalize what people are going to do anyways? Exactly. It creates another problem and makes the whole enterprise more dangerous. And second of all, again, people should have a right to do this stuff as long as they're not hurting other people. Right. So you and, store it safely. You have to not let your kids get into it. That's you right. can't drive after using it. And you can't, you know, just um, 
abnegate all your adult responsibilities. But right. given that you don't do any of those things, um, you know, you know, more power to you. I mean, it, this stuff helps people. It, they don't pretend it helps people. It really does help people. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you took an old phrase, a famous one from former First Lady Nancy Reagan, just say no, <laughs> and turned it into just say wait. And your suggestion is age 18. And, and a lot of psychiatrists say age 25, because well, that's when the brain stops developing. Yeah, but I, I the argument we should have the drinking age be age 25 too. Good luck with that. And second right. of all, college kids smoke pot. You can either have them be open about it, or you could have them be subterranean about it. If they're open about it, they're more likely to get help if they're having problems. So I think 18 makes a lot of sense. A lot of people would argue 21, and a lot of people would argue 25. Right. And I agree to respectfully disagree with these people. All right. Um, let me say, um, I, if, if I were, uh, you know, this is my personal opinion, just say wait, you suggest 18, some say 25. What would you think of 65 or whatever the retirement age is? And well, now no, I'm no, into my own personal choices, but that is my plan. I'm waiting till 65 or retirement to start having these experiences possibly. Um, and uh, I, could joke and say you're, I could joke and say you're missing out, but it's really interesting you say that because the fastest growing demographic of cannabis users is 65 and above by far, but that's for a slightly different reason. That's for medical uses. They're finding right. it helps them with the polypharmacy, with their anxiety, with their pain, with their sleep much more safely and comfortably than a lot of the pharmaceutical Chemo treatment. Yeah. For yeah. cancer. Now, if you're a teenager, someone says, just say no, you're like, fuck you. If someone says, <laughs> just say wait, you're like, well, that's a little bit more of a hopeful message. Maybe that makes a little bit more sense. So I think it's a more sensible message from the point of view of like the doctors, but it's also a more sensible point of view in terms of how the teenagers hear it. They're not saying you can't ever do this. It's like, you know, when you're in recovery, they say one day at a time. It's like, it's not forever. And I just think it's a much more uh, hopeful and moderated message that, you know, uh, a te you know, teenagers can get addicted to cannabis because they, you know, um, they, to a certain extent, addiction is a learning disorder and they could learn to self-treat their anxiety, their loneliness, their boredom, their angst with like a quick puff or two from their concealed vape. And I think they are particularly susceptible to addiction to a lot of the stuff. And, and, and also when you're younger, you're more vulnerable. If you wait to 65, the advantage of that is you're well beyond I just had a piece yesterday in CNN about does cannabis cause psychosis? And it doesn't cause psychosis if you're 65. It it might aggravate psychosis if you're in your teens or 20s. So it would be a lot safer in terms of psychosis risk. And it would be a lot safer in terms of um, of psychosis risk. and be a lot safer in terms of brain development if everybody waited till they're 65. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't want to make people feel bad or marginalize them or stigmatize them. And, and you need to... You need to, most of all, promote open communication, not just about these drugs, about all drugs, or people end up dying. So I just think you have to find a way to communicate with people so that they can feel comfortable being open and honest with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned, uh, you know, cherishing human brains. Um, honestly, I'd love for our culture, our modern world civilization to embrace cherishing human brains to treat them with the utmost care and maintenance, you know, starting with the kids. Um, maybe I, I don't want to say lost generations, but they're, they're certainly on a different plan that I may not consider particularly functional, somewhat dysfunctional in my opinion. Um, we don't cherish the human brain uh, in this way that I'm describing. And instead we pollute it, we abuse it, um, I, I'm going to step off my soapbox in a second here, I promise. But, you know, let, let's train our brains. Uh, let's have, you know, vigorous exercise. Um, you know, in my own case, um, in spite of my brain's shortcomings, I, I cherish it. It's my meal ticket, my problem solver at NASA and the contractor I work for pay me to put it to use for them. It's also kept me out of trouble, mostly in my personal life, both in staying healthy and so on, but also keeping my relationships healthy, mostly. I'm just very hesitant to experiment with my brain until after I retire and I've saved enough to take all sorts of chances in my twilight years, like flying an airplane and things like that. This is on my list of retirement act activities, including trips that you have described today, you know, chemical 
experiences. Um, by the way, I, I do have weird visual effects occasionally. I think they're called ocular migraines. Or Oh, those are miserable. Actually, cannabis is very good for those. Oh, I'll keep that in mind again and as I get closer to my, um, hey, let's start experimenting with my brain phase of my life. That chapter is coming up a little quicker than I would hope. You didn't But mention yes, social I do. media. Social media is like so destructive for the teenagers. I mean, honestly, if I had a teenager and I were given the choice by whatever, by a God, do you want your kid to smoke pot three times a week or to use social media every day? I would probably say smoke pot over the social media. The social media makes everybody miserable. It looks like everybody else is having more fun than they are. Mm -hmm. I, I, it doesn't make me miserable. It's, it's kind of exciting. I'm, I'm sad that people are abusing it, but at its best, it's so educational. It's so connecting during the pandemic. I, I live alone. Maybe, maybe that's a sign that my method doesn't work. But aside from that, I, um, you know, I did feel connected to others thanks to social media. And uh, of course, it can be abused like anything, like human language is abused. So um, I don't know. I, I, I hope this is my dream. I can't control the world. But I, I'd love for beautiful, healthy people to be sort of spokesmodels, men and women. Hey, take great care of your brain, exercise vigorously, never stop learning, don't pollute your brain, and then reap the benefits of better jobs, better mates, better lives, less dysfunction, less sadness. We don't, we don't have that right now. Look, What Scott, are your you have thoughts to distinguish about this alternate universe that may be unrealistic? you have to distinguish between drugs. Like alcohol, all bad for your brain. Exactly. Doesn't have a good relationship. I never touch it. Never touch caffeine. I know that you're a caffeine guy and I, I respect that, but I don't touch that either. I am a chocolate guy, so maybe that's Caffeine is my second favorite plant based medication. But, anyways, um, now, um, but some, you know, mushrooms can be very therapeutic. Um, cannabis can be very therapeutic. Cannabis is complicated because it can be used very harmfully or it could be used very helpfully. So I just don't think you could generalize. It depends on the person, the drug, and how they're using it. It could be, these drugs can be very powerful, you know, pain control. Like who wants to go through surgery without an opiate? That's torture. So Mm these drugs can be very, very powerful tools to help evolve, help us be physically healthy and help us with spiritual and psychological evolution or they could be life-threatening. So it depends on the drug and the person. I just don't think you could generalize. -hmm. Let's see. Um, uh, of course, uh, these chemicals have such powerful effects and, you know, humanity does sometimes manage powerful things effectively, uh, not as effectively as we would want. But I was thinking of just in our daily lives, you know, there's some people that fly airplanes. I'm not one of them yet. But most of us operate motor vehicles, so we, we're trained to use cars, and the cars are well-designed, typically, to protect us and others, and the roads are well-constructed and engineered with traffic lights and so on. And can we make the equivalent of that in your psychedelic world, where it's like, hey, this chemical is now very well-engineered And I, I'm not convinced, again, I'm not the standard here, but just being able to talk to you in this circumstance, um, you know, that uh, it seems to me that this does seem still kind of uh, the wild, wild west of science instead of, you know, the equivalent of engineering an automobile that we can operate safely. Can we operate these chemicals safely? I'm, I'm skeptical. Well, it is the wild, wild west, but a lot of research is being done on them. For example, as I mentioned, they're trying to come up with medications that help with depression and then don't even give you the trip. Right. But they study these things for safety, for feasibility, and then they do large scale studies to prove efficacy. And then they do post-market surveillance to make sure no horrible side effect comes up five years later, like with Fen Fen, that weight loss drug that was causing heart valve problems. So we're pretty safe about how we do this, but we there's no, it's not foolproof. Um, so, uh, you know, we do the best that we can. There are harms, there are benefits, and we just try to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms. And, you know, there's no perfect system. I think that decriminalizing and not having law enforcement involved makes it a lot safer. But, you know, uh, this, some of the stuff is really addictive, you know, like the opiates. And 
it, nobody, we haven't figured this out yet, but I, I just don't think banning them works at all because oh, sure. people yeah, do in the fact, you mentioned about Colorado and Oregon decriminalizing psychedelics. And um, of course, there's other nations. Uh, uh, I think of Portugal, for example. Isn't that right? Um, Absolutely. They yeah, and so we can learn from their successes or perhaps, um, you know, their experiments that uh, may not be working quite right. And honestly, it does look like they've had trouble and they've they've diagnosed. They, they cut the down government. on the treatment. When they originally decriminalized, they funded treatment and jobs training and housing. And then they took away the funding for that. But they kept it they? Yeah. So it was working when they were paying for treatment and giving social services. Then when they withdrew those, I think for budgetary reasons, it didn't work as well. So, you know, you don't just decriminalize, you decriminalize and treat people who have a problem and make sure people have a place to live and health care or health insurance and addiction treatment. So it's not just a question of decriminalizing. It has to be decriminalizing with sane, humane, empathic social policies. Mm -hmm. So they, they've gotten off track in Portugal, but at least presumably they can get back on track if they start following the proper processes. Is that, is, exactly. Is, okay. Yeah, because one of our participants, it's uh, Melissa from uh, Virginia, she pointed out there's uh, so many um, males in this in the United States that are, are just not in the workforce. And a lot of that is involved with, you know, their... Um, misusing these substances and uh, you know harming their brains and so they can't compete well with a clean and sober or relatively clean and sober um, alternatives that employers prefer um, you know with a, a, a very clear mind you can be a tremendous contributor to your team whereas if there's somebody that's dysfunctional it's it's a different type of experience Right. But is the dysfunction is, for example, a lot of people bunkered in their parents' basement smoking cannabis all the time. Is the cannabis the cause or like the symptom? Right. It's very hard to say because there are plenty of super motivational people um, that use cannabis every day and that are like, like you know, Musk. Doc yeah, yeah, doctors and lawyers and, and, and academics. So Carl can, Sagan. Yes. Carl Sagan, <laughs> exactly, who was a, a family friend. So it actually um, can go both ways. And, you know, with these people, the cannabis is always making it worse if they're really dysfunctional, but it's very hard to untangle whether the cannabis is a symptom of their misery or actually causing them to be dysfunctional. And I think it's sort of a, you get into a negative feedback loop. I, I do have my own experience, which of course is not scientific, but it is factual. And that is it, when you're in school, you grow up with particular classmates. Occasionally some move in or out of town, but I have longitudinal observations, I don't know if I'm using the words correctly, of my childhood friends, some of whom uh, changed over to alcohol and uh, cannabis and other substances, and I saw a change in them. So I saw the pre-drug person, and then I saw the post-drug person. So I, I knew that I mean, maybe they had anxieties or something. Right, that but you don't know if the drug is causing the change. With alcohol, it's usually the drug. But you don't know if the drug is causing the change or if they're having problems and they're miserable and they're self-treating with the drug. And the drugs. I, I saw them beforehand and they weren't having these issues. And of course, when you're growing, you, you're going to have onset. But it's an interesting coincidence that they had these problems and they used drugs rather than, hey, I know this kid and he's a melancholy a uh, sad person, and now he's using drugs. No, no, these are normal, ha happy kids. And if I'm pretty sure if they lived in a world without these strange substances, they would have prospered and flourished. Uh, but I, of course, I can't be certain of that. This is only my impression. And also solidified my own plan of, hey, just, just wait until I'm in my 60s or whatever, and then go tripping on the magic carpet ride and so on. And, um, I love seeing- You have a lot of fun when you're 65. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I should sign off in a couple minutes because oh, I, understand. I told I understand. my 90-year-old aunt she could come visit me. I'm, I'm home with a broken leg. It's a long story. Oh my so, God. Yeah, I got hit by a car. So um, I told my 90-year-old aunt she can come, She and her dog can come visit me. So I, I, see, I, I shouldn't have brought up automobiles. No, then. totally oh, fine. Now listen, um, I guess my last question as we're signing off here is, 
Um, you know, I mentioned about vigorous exercise, and it sounds like you you agree that this is a great therapy, and maybe therapy number one if feasible. And I I just looked in, you know, college athletes have lower suicide rates than other people in that age group, and college athletes are dealing with failure and humiliation in front of sometimes thousands of people, millions of people watching on TV. I just saw this recently when I was at a National Hockey League game and my Washington Capitals were humiliated by an inferior team. And I was like, wow, these guys, they, they're resilient. And that that vigorous exercise is almost certainly part of what makes them so able to problem solve and move on, hopefully, to victory. By the way, they're in your town. And in about 20 minutes, they're going to be on ABC television uh, playing your Boston Bruins. Um, hopefully they all have recovered from this, these previous setbacks, but it's like, let's imitate these athletes. They're generally healthy and, and functional and they avoid depression and these other issues. And then if, if there's any that don't respond then to use these interesting interventions that, you know, might be safe and, and, and do exactly what you want. Uh, in, in most cases, you know, people have different genetic um, you know, uh, you know the personalized medicine might be an issue there. Hey, one last thing before I let you go, if I may, Peter, you mentioned Carl Sagan. Do you have a Carl Sagan story? Um, yes. Um, on my website, there's a picture of me on his lap and him teaching me how to read. Cool. Um, <laughs> I always joke that I was teaching him how to read, but I'm, oh. I was clearly like seven years old and he was an adult. Um, he was, the book we're reading is the man who cried. I am, which is a really complicated book for an adult. So I don't know why he was teaching me how to read the man who cried. I am, but uh, yeah, we have a lot of Carl Sagan stories, but I, I don't have time for them today. We'll have to schedule another session. That's, that's all right. That's all right. I, I'm great. I'm glad that you got to have that experience with him. And, uh, I I've gotten to meet him and he was absolutely Carl brilliant. Sagan. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I do wonder if maybe he oh, would, and I cite him a lot in my book because he talks in detail about how cannabis facilitated his creative, his scientific and creative right. process. Yeah, I, I realized, I mean, we didn't have a twin brother of Carl Sagan to see if, you know, that one didn't use cannabis. Um, you know, maybe actually Sagan was, uh, he was very smart, but maybe he was diminished. We can't be 100% sure. Uh, well, you should read what he wrote, and then you could ask if he was diminished. Well, then um, he may have been even brill more brilliant if he hadn't used it. I I wonder, but well, yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point. We don't really know. True. Yes, Peter, thank you again so much for your time. I hope you heal completely. And uh, again, please, uh, uh, you know, consider my questions to be rather skeptical and not judgmental. And I I want to be very clear about that. We we there's so little that we know about the human brain, and your you're fighting to help people. And, um, you know, I, I salute you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the great questions. Alrighty. Well, you have a good day now and um, take care. Enjoy the nice weather. Will do. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.